Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Duke. Welcome to our final installment of Fairy Tales, our Freedom Project Academy lecture series. Uh, wonderful to be with you again, and let's get right to it. We've talked a lot about, uh, I think we've done a good job, and talked a lot about the origins of fairy tales, how they manifest themselves, the morality, and we're going to wind down today with our last look at the second part of George MacDonald's really classic fairy tale, uh, which is beautiful and moving the light princess. And is, we start uh, by taking a look at MacDonald himself. Luckily, MacDonald lived at the turn of the 19th century, uh, and so we have some actual images of him, a photograph of MacDonald. He looks like the kind of guy that would write fairy tales like this. I mentioned before that he was a minister, uh, rather a radical minister in his own way devoted to the idea of Christ, the gospel idea of Christ, uh, more than he was devoted to churches and congregations and buildings. He was dedicated to the radical love of Jesus Christ. And out of that radical love grew these fairy tales that he shared with his children. In fact, here we have the lion in winter, so to speak. This was MacDonald at the end of his life uh, being cared for, 1905 being cared for by his nurse. Uh, and you see there, that uh, the, those eyes have lost none of their curiosity and fire. Interestingly, in uh, one of the most beautiful editions of The Light Princess that we have, um, one of the most uh, uh, beautiful uh, illustrated versions of the story, it's been illustrated many times, was even done as a Broadway show, The Light Princess, that was moderately successful in London and then again in New York. And so uh, one of the most beautiful editions we have was actually uh, illustrated by Maurice Sendak, the wonderful ch children's book illustrator who gave us, among other things, where the wild things are. And the illustrations of the light princess that Sendak, Sendak did were really remarkable. I'll share a few of, of them with you now. You can really immediately see that this is the same pen uh, that sketched the wild things. Uh, there you have the image of uh, the baptismal curse. You have the image of the baptism curse. All right, there's Princess Makem Know It there, uh, hovering over the baptismal font. There is the uh, baby about to be baptized, our princess. Uh, and you can see the bishop standing to the right with, the, with his bishop's staff in his hand. Here is the princess floating, the floating princess. Uh, there she is in the light princess, and you can see that everybody's gathered around. This, this is under the stairs, of course, with the servants, not the king and the queen. And there she is floating to the ceiling, uh, a stick that's used to help retrieve her. Uh, and we have the light princess who has no gravity, who floats. Uh, and then we have this image. Uh, the one place where she felt that she could uh, have some gravity was swimming. So there was this wonderful big lake immediately outside the castle, as we mentioned last time, and the fairy princess would have her servants, her attendants, put her into the water. And it's as if somehow the clothes that she wear became soaked, and that gave her a kind of, of gravity in the water. And it was her favorite place in the world, and she could swim like a dolphin. And so she would spend her days zipping back and forth underneath the water. Uh, and so we see the princess floating with no gravity, and we see her floating uh, in the pond, uh, in the pool outside of her, of her castle, uh, with the only place where she had any sense of weight. And that becomes the theme for today. And so, like all good fairy tales, in The Light Princess, you need a prince, a prince to come and ultimately pair up with the princess at the end of the story. And this prince came from thousands and thousands of miles away. He went on a quest to find a princess, as princesses, as princes are wont to do. He needed to find the perfect princess for him. And so while he was traveling the world seeking a princess, uh, the horse he was traveling with uh, became too old and too tired. He ended up getting off on foot. He had lost most of his provisions. He was down to his last uh, bit of money, and he literally had become kind of a peasant boy, uh, searching the wilderness for a woman, who a princess, who would be a suitable mate for him as a prince. And as he was walking through the woods one day near the king's castle, he heard all of this squealing coming from the, the lake outside the castle, uh, squealing these high-pitched high screeches that were coming from, as we know, the light princess as she swam. And so being a good prince, he immediately stripped off his clothing uh, and jumped into the water to try to rescue what he thought was a drowning woman. And uh, he swam up to her and he pulled her out onto the shore and not surprisingly, she was livid. She wasn't drowning, she was enjoying herself and the prince had pulled her out of the lake. And we get this wonderful uh, fairy tale moment where, the press, where we find out from George MacDonald that suddenly the prince paused and listened. Strange sounds came across the water. It was in fact the princess laughing. Now there was something odd in her laugh, as I have already hinted, for the hatching of a real hearty laugh 
requires the incubation of gravity. That's a beautiful, another one of those beautiful fairy tale uh, uh, re- revelations from, from MacDonald, that in order to love, you have to cry. You have to be able to cry. You have to have suffered. And in order to laugh, too, this is a revolutionary idea, I think, from MacDonald. In order to have a real deep laugh, a meaningful laugh, now that laugh has to be incubated by gravity. And by now we realize that with all the other dozens of possible reason, uh, meanings for words like light and gravity, uh, dozens and dozens of puns and wonderful quips about them, gravity and, uh, has come to mean for MacDonald suffering, right? Weight, the weight of our fallen human existence uh, from a woman, a princess who can't fall. She can only go up unless she's in the water. Right. So now there was something odd in her laugh, as I have already hinted, for the hatching of a real hearty laugh requires the incubation of gravity. And perhaps this was how the prince mistook the laughter for screaming. And that's another beautiful idea. There was very little to distinguish. We'd never heard her cry. Uh, we'd never heard her scream in ang- a- agony or pain. Uh, all we had was these, these peals of laughter, uh, even in the face of death and the suffering of others. Looking over the lake, The prince saw something white in the water, and in an instant, he had torn off his tunic, kicked off his sandals, and plunged in. He soon reached the white object and found that it was a woman. There was not light enough to show that she was a princess, but quite enough light to show that she was a lady, for it does not need much light to see that. And so all night long, the princess would swim in this pool, and it was freedom for her. She was liber- uh, 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 freed, uh, given freedom from the uh, terrible condition of weightlessness in the water. And so the prince, uh, thinking he's doing a good deed, dives into the water, pulls her out, uh, and uh, ultimately makes a mess of it. And so not surprisingly, the princess, <clears throat> the princess wants back in. And so we see in the next slide, the prince says to her, well, how am I to put you in? And now that they're out and he's holding on to her so she doesn't fly away. How am I to put you in? The prince says, that is your business, she answered quite snappishly. You took me out. Put me in again. Very well, said the prince. And catching her up in his arms, he sprang with her from the rock. The princess had just time to give one delighted shriek of laughter before the water closed over them both. When they came to the surface, she found that for a moment or two, she could not even laugh for she had gone down with such a rush that it was with difficulty that she recovered her breath. And so now we have, in in a really beautiful way, the moment where she falls, the very first moment, really, that she falls, is when the prince takes her in her arms, leaps from the rock. This is very Kierkegaardian, isn't it, also? It's that leap of faith, uh, the idea that logic reason, can, science, can bring us perhaps to the brink of believing in things greater than us, but you still have to exercise your free will and leap. And in this case, note, it's really kind of neat. She can't jump herself. She's not experienced gravity yet. She hasn't learned how to suffer. She hasn't cried yet. And so she can't take the leap herself, but the prince can take her in his arms, leap for the both of them, and in they fall. And that's a remarkable image, the fall. Uh, she has her fall, so to speak, in an uh, incubatory way. How do you like falling in when they come to the surface, right? They both shoot to the surface of the water, and there they sit under the moonlight in the warm lake, uh, w- drenched to the bone. And he says to her, how do you like falling in? It seemed to me like going up, she said. And that's quite lovely too, right? Uh, What is falling for you and I, given her reversed gravity, uh, is going up uh, and moving higher, getting, getting closer to where she ought to be as a human being. How do you like falling in, said the prince? It seemed to me like going up, rejoined she. My feeling, he said, was certainly one of elevation too. And of course, the prince is talking about love, right? That he has already fallen in love with her. My feeling was certainly one of elevation too, said the prince. How do you like falling in? The princess said to him. His response, oh, beyond everything, said the prince. For I have fallen in with the only perfect creature I ever saw. Right, and you have that wonderful fairy tale moment where it's kind of love at first sight. This is, in a traditional fairy tale, this is, would, would be love at first sight for both of them. But of course, she can't love yet. And so her response to this, uh, her response to the, the idea, right? Uh, I like it beyond everything the prince said, for I have fallen in with, fallen in with the only perfect creature I ever saw. Her response, no more of that, she says. 
I am tired of it. Don't you like falling in then? said the prince. And her response, it is the most delightful fun I've ever had in my life. I never fell before. I wish I could learn to think. I am the only person in my father's kingdom who can't fall. And there's the, that's the tragedy of this, isn't it? Uh, you know, when you uh, stop and think about the predicament of the light princess, uh, it, there's a temptation to see it as kind of wonderfully airy and otherworldly, the ability to float, to be carried away on breezes, the ability to hover in the air, not to be borne down, and more importantly, from a, a metaphysical, theological standpoint, not to suffer the stains of suffering in time. And this is an interesting thing. Uh, when I talk to, when, the standard retort I get from atheists all the time, uh, from people who do not believe in the metaphysical realities, God, heaven, angels, uh, is always, if God exists and created us and then did not take from us our suffering, <clears throat> then consequently he is not a God worth following. That any God who took the trouble to create creatures uh, to care for them, to make them sustain life on this world, in this world. Any God who would do that and then allow them to suffer, to get diseases, to die, uh, that God is an unjust God. Uh, and, and I think these fairy tales really understand the deeper reality. Given our choices, free will, free will, the idea that uh, we must choose God, we must choose the higher way, uh, to have everything given to us, to be completely accommodated, in every way, would mean we wouldn't need God. We would have become God. If God made us in such a way that we had his omniscience, his uh, 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 all-knowingness, his eternality, his lack of material substance, his uh, freedom from time and pain and death, if that were the case, then he would have made us gods. And that's the big complaint, isn't it, by our modern atheist friends, that man should have been a god. If God made us, then he should have made us like himself. And that is terribly selfish, uh, and that is terribly myopic, and it is terribly uh, anti fairy tale in its outlook. This idea here that the light princess is light isn't just the idea that she is light of body, but she's also light of soul and the deeper things that make human life and any kind of relationship with God possible. She's lacking them through no fault of her own, but she's lacking them. And so if you go back to the slide, she said, she's tired of that. I don't want to hear that stuff from you. Don't, you. don't you like falling in, then, said the princess. Her response, it is the most delightful fun I ever had in my life. I never fell before. I wish I could learn. And she sees the sorrow of her. She recognizes, without being able to suffer for it, the tragedy of her own position. To think that I am the only person in my father's kingdom that cannot fall. Because if you can't fall, you can't be risen again. If you can't fall, uh, then you can't be brought back either. And so moving forward, but when the prince, who had really fallen in love when he fell in the lake, began to talk to her about love, she always turned her, heads toward, her head toward him and laughed. Again, whether it's the death of, of the, her king, the father's armies, whether it's the threat that maybe the kingdom would be overrun and pillaged by, uh, by enemies, nothing but a hearty laugh. Here, too, when the prince seriously tried to talk to her about what it means to fall in love. And I think that's the point, isn't it? We don't leap into love. We don't spring into it. We fall, right? It is a fall. It is a fall that is, uh, it remakes us in many ways. It's uh, uh, troublesome and anxiety-ridden and vulner makes you vulnerable. Uh, love is suffering. Uh, and the more you love someone or something, uh, the more you're willing to suffer on his or her behalf. And, and this idea of falling in love, it, it must have its origins, must have its origins in the fall of man too. Um, remember in the earlier lecture, MacDonald referred to falling in love as beast, a combination of honey and bee stings, right? That, sure, it's sweet, uh, and it can be very sweet, almost cloyingly sweet at times, but it's also, uh, let's not forget the stings that go with bees when you try to retrieve their honey. Falling in love is that way. And so whenever the prince, who had really fallen in love when he had fell in the lake, began to talk to her about love, she always turned her head towards him and laughed. After a while, she began to look puzzled as if she were trying to understand what he meant, but could not, revealing a notion that he meant something. But soon as ever she left the lake, she was so altered that the prince said to himself, if I may marry her, if I one day marry her, I see no help for it. We must turn merman and mermaid and go out to sea at once. 
And so there is this unusual uh, fact about her that she feels more when she's in the lake than when she's out of it. It's not just self the selfish pleasure of swimming. Uh, intrinsically, the princess recognizes that while she's in the water, and perhaps, again, it's just her clothes, the, the, the sodden nature of her clothes that are enough to pull down the balloon a little bit, the, the more or less balloon that is her body, hold it down a little bit in the water. But she uh, enjoys incredible freedom. And with that freedom in the lake, comes a slightly heightened sense of feeling. Uh, but the minute that the, they come to get her in the morning, the, 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 the chamberlain comes out to the lake first thing in the morning to take her back into the house so she can go about her normal day, eat and whatnot. She becomes the person she was before she found the water, which means utterly indifferent. So the prince sees this, right, that when she's out of the lake, before she gets in the lake, she's a very different person, utterly callous, utterly insensitive, utterly unable to... And this is the key, utterly unable to empathize. It's one thing to feel sorry for somebody else. Uh, that's a step, I suppose, sympathy. Empathy is a whole other issue. Empathy is the ability to feel what somebody else feels, to take their suffering on yourself. Uh, she hasn't even cracked sympathy here in the lake, although she becomes curious and she realizes that the prince is talking about something, an extraordinary experience that she herself can't uh, grab, can't grasp. Uh, and nevertheless, when she's out of the water, she reverts back to the completely light, uh, su uh, su insubstantial thing when it comes to human relationships in particular. And so the prince recognizes that if, if, as things stand now, if I ever were to marry her, I see no help for it. We would have to turn merman and mermaid and go out to sea at once. Perhaps the deeper the water, the more the pull, right? The deeper the waters of the ocean, the more perhaps they might pull at her and perhaps begin to spark in her some sense of understanding. And if we go to the next one. The poor princess necessarily nearly went out of her little mind, what little mind she had. When she's out of the water together, Right? When she's not there, the idea that the princess would be out of the water or would not have the water, that's the one thing that alarmed her. That's the one thing that made her uh, incredibly, incredibly nervous, uh, the, the possibility of the lack of water. And what happens is that Princess Makem Noet, our villain, she comes back and she sees that despite the fact that her curse has worked well and the princess has no gravity, she's also bitter, princess make them know it, that the, prince, the princess finds happiness in the water. She didn't intend that. She intended this princess to go through her life without any gravity, which means no love, no depth, and ultimately no ability to be redeemed, to make this princess go through her life nothing more than a bubble. And so when she finds, Princess Makem know it, that the, the lake itself has become a source of some gravity to the princess, she devises a plan. She sneaks way under the caves beneath the lake, and she uh, puts a spell on the lake. She attaches this little wicked snake creature, very, guard, very much garden imagery, right? The serpent, she takes this serpent and she attaches it to a drain at the very bottom of the lake. And over the next weeks and weeks and weeks, this tiny little serpent begins to suck all the water through the drain, through the hole that Princess Makem Noet has created at the bottom of the lake. And the snake gets bigger and bigger. The serpent becomes huge of all the water. And on the surface, day by day, the level of the, rake, the lake begins to recede so that the rocks, be, after a while, you begin to see the rocks at the bottom and you, it, the whole thing is drying up. And this is breaking, this is destroying the princess. It was the one place she felt any gravity, and the loss of the lake begins to weigh heavy on her. And so as we go back to the clip, the poor princess, as she saw this, the poor princess nearly went out of the little mind she had. It was awful to her to see the lake, which she loved more than any living thing, lie dying before her eyes. It sank away slowly, vanishing. The tops of the rocks that had never been seen till now began to appear far down in the clear water. Before long, they were dry in the sun. It was fearful to her to think of the mud that would soon lie there baking and festering, full of lovely creatures dying and ugly creatures coming to life, like the unmaking of a world. And how the hot sun would be without any lake, how hot the sun would be without any lake, she could not bear to swim in it any more. And she began to pine away. Her life seemed bound up with it. And ever, ever as the lake sank, she pined the more. People said, 
She would not live an hour after the lake was gone. But still, she never cried. And we hear that refrain again and again and again throughout the book. But still, she never cried. And it's really remarkable when you think about it. There is something uh, insufficient. If this, was, if this was a modern day fairy tale, the lake would be a living thing and it would be the source of life for her. You think about the kind of weird way we've allowed paganism to creep back into our culture. We're not breeding more atheists uh, with all of this uh, materialistic understanding of the universe. We're not breeding more atheists, we're breeding more pagans. We are reanimating the world. If you think about the global warming cult uh, and how they have taken nature and animated again, uh, this lake would have been the answer. The lake would have been the giver of life, but it's not enough. There's nothing in, created, in the created world that can give us the kind of gravity that we need to be, understand, to be able to understand the higher realities, particularly the reality of God. And so here the lake is dying and she is somehow bound up with that lake, but that is not necessarily, uh, it's a good thing that she has this little bit of gravity, but the lake is a poor substitute for what it is that she needs. And that's love. And that is particularly human love. And that is particularly human love that will give way to the love of God. That's that hierarchy there. And so as the lake dries up and dies, and the, the pretty creatures in it begin to die, and in the mud and the slime at the bottom of the, of the damp lake bed, ugly creatures uh, begin to form, right? The things that lay eggs in muddy, in muddy climates, those reptilian things. It was fearful to think of the mud that would soon lie there, baking and festering, uh, full of lovely creatures dying and ugly creatures coming to life, like the unmaking of a world. The un, it's the anti-creation. You've got the snake, don't you, in this Garden of Eden. You've got the snake that is draining the river. You've got now this unmaking of a world. Uh, the, all the watery chaos that was separated at the beginning of the world to create life when God created the heavens and the earth. Now that water, it's kind of like a, a Noah's flood and a, a expulsion from the Garden of Eden. All of those wonderful biblical images here as that serpent drains that water dry. And she too, her life is bound up with it. And in spite of all of this, in spite of all of these realities, she never cried. She didn't cry. So she was not able to uh, suffer even properly for the death of the one thing, that lake, that mattered to her more than anything else. And so it happened one day that a party of youngsters who were walking through the bed of the river. Think about how many years that, how many centuries that lake had been there and how many things had been dropped into it by accident. This is a one not, perhaps positive consequence of the lake drying up is that you might find all sorts of things at the bottom of the lake bed. It happened one day that a party of youngsters found themselves on the brink of one of those pools in the very center of the lake that was left. It was a rocky basin of considerable depth. Looking in, they saw at the bottom something something that shone yellow in the sun. A little boy jumped in and dived for it. It was a plate of gold covered with writing. They carried it to the king. On one side of it stood these words. Death alone from death can save. Love is death, and so is brave. Love can fill the deepest grave. Love loves on beneath the wave. And that is a really quite beautiful little poem. And everything we've talked about so far in The Light Princess and in fairy tales generally can be summed up in those four lines. Death alone from death can save. That what saves us from death? Well, dying does. Dying saves us. It's a paradox, right? Because of the sacrifice of Christ, because of that selfless sacrifice of the only innocent being who ever walked the earth, God's own son and co-creator of the universe. It was his death and then subsequent rise, his fall, so to speak, Christ's voluntary fall uh, out in love. And, and what, what prompted this fall? What, made, what brought Christ down? It was love, his love for his creation. This voluntary love, this death, is what saved us paradoxically because Christ's death and his subsequent resurrection, his rise, got rid of death, got rid of the possible, made death only a window as opposed to a door made it something to pass through rather than a wall that can't be breached in any way. And so death alone from death did save. Love is death, and so is brave. To love somebody else 
it is a kind of dying to the self, isn't it? It is a kind of dying to your own selfish needs, wants, desires. It's a dying to uh, that solipsism, that worldview of, of that you are everything, that the world revolves around you. It is opening yourself up to somebody else. Death alone from death can save. Love is death, and so is brave. Love can fill the deepest grave. Love loves on beneath the wave. And when the waves of time roll over us, uh, when our lives are done, the only thing that will remain is what we have loved and how we've done it. It's a beautiful fairy tale uh, implication here, but all of it. Uh, and I, I suggested earlier in the earlier segments that so much of the Western fairy tale goes back to the, the Bible, and particularly the Gospels. If you think about the story of the Gospels, uh, what I, there are a lot of things. But among other things, they are the greatest fairy tale ever told, right? If fairy tales are all about uh, the loss of innocence, suffering that leads to great awakening and ultimately happiness ever after, then the Gospels really are perhaps the best example and the origin of so many of Western fairy tales, in particular this beautiful fairy tale itself. Death alone from death can save. Love is death, therefore it is brave. To love that way is brave. Love can fill the deepest grave. There's no place, even the darkest existential nightmare, right? Underground in death. Uh, love is there too. Love loves on beneath the wave. That as the waves of time roll over us, that's what will endure. And it's that love, that love that is like death, uh, that is the salvation ultimately of us all. Now, of course... This was enigmatical enough to the king and the courtiers. This, was, this little poem wasn't as self-evident to the king and his court as it is to you and me, who've been talking for four consecutive hours. But the reverse of the play, when they flipped it over, it explained the poetry just a little bit. Its writing amounted to this. This is what it said. <clears throat> if the lake should disappear, they must find the hole through which the water ran but it would be useless to try to stop it by any ordinary means. There was but one effectual mode. The body of a living man could alone stanch the flow. The man must give himself of his own will, and the lake must take his life as it filled. Otherwise, the offering would be of no avail. If the nation could not provide one hero to give his life for the lake, then it was time the lake should perish. And that is a remarkable, remarkable piece of philosophy and theology. Take a look at it a little bit more closely. If the lake should disappear, it, they, the people of the kingdom, must find the hole through which the water ran. They must find that the source of what drained the life away of the lake. But it would be useless to try to stop it by any other man. You can't fill it with what's in in the hole, the existential hole in humanity, right? What is our existential hole? That which we can't fill. It's the absence of God, isn't it? In the Garden of Eden, we had God with us. We're told in the in the Bible that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. They saw His face. They knew Him. They could speak to Him directly without any priests or ministers or intermediaries. They were with Him. And since the fall of man, since that fall where Adam and Eve chose selfish and selfish love, love of self over love of God, right? the only love ultimately that can raise dead things to life, and death was brought into the world, there's been a perpetual hole in the human soul. We can fill it with all sorts of things. We can fill it with family and with children. We can fill it with money and power. Uh, we can fill it with pleasure and leisure. And that hole never gets filled because that's the way we were made. We were made for God. We weren't made for this world. So all the things of this world, and that includes human love, that includes husband and wife, mother and, fa mother and daughter, all of that too, as ultimately potentially satisfying as it can be, it's not enough to fill the existential hole uh, of which only God can. And what, what was it that in our fallen human lives that stepped into the breach that could, could possibly fill that hole? And that was the coming of Christ. Right? And uh, that's the sacrificial victim, that w until one offered, one innocent one was sacrificed uh, to pay the ransom for us who are guilty. That hole could never be fixed. That wall could never be breached between our world and his. And that's the beauty of it. And you see this again here. If the lake should disappear, the people of the kingdom should find, must find the hole through which the water ran. We must identify what's missing in our lives. 
What is it that makes everything else make sense? Even human love, even the, 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 love, the love between a husband and a wife, between parents and children, even that love is a shadow of what it could be if it's not first run through, sifted through love of God. If the love of God is there, then all human loves become blessed loves. Without the love of God, the best human loves can turn uh, to, to uh, ineffectiveness at the very best. And so to understand this, I think, is what McDonald's trying to say. If that lake should disappear, the people must find the hole through which it's drained away. There was but one effective mode to do this. The body of a living man alone could stanch the flow. And that living man is Christ Jesus. Uh, the man must, in reality, not so much in the fairy tale, the man, this man, whoever it was, this scapegoat, this person who volunteered, innocent, to die for the guilty, he must give himself completely <clears throat> of his own free will. No compelled love will do it. Nobody, and you think about primitive culture, right? In primitive, primitive cultures where uh, superstitious pagan cultures, where with the advent of winter, as, as the long winter dragged on, uh, sometimes what these, cult these tribes would do is they would find somebody to sacrifice, to throw into a volcano or to sacrifice on an altar uh, as a way of propitiating the false gods, the demonic false gods, to try to bring summer back, spring back, right? Maybe we end winter if we sacrifice, we pick one person person out of all of the tribe, and we heap on that person. It's called scapegoating, right? We make them the scapegoat. We pick one person from the tribe, and on that person, we cast all the collective guilt of the tribe. Now, if you ever read Sheila Jackson's The Lottery, you'll get a sense, short story, you'll get a sense of this as well. Uh, it, we, we cast upon this one individual all the sins of the collective, and then we sacrifice that human life to the volcano, to the, to the vengeful gods. Uh, we slit their throats. We cast them into the volcano. Uh, in, the way, in the name of the Aztecs, we rip their hearts out and offer them up to the great sun god to propitiate our sins. And so the coming of Christ is different, right? Those sacrificial victims were, uh, not, uh, were almost never volunteers. They were uh, plucked from their families and they were offered up whether they wanted to be or not. The coming of Christ was different though. It had to be completely 100% voluntary. And if it was not, it would not be accepted. And so here you have that argument, right? This, this man must give himself of his own will and the lake must take its life as it filled. As the, the, the life of the lake came rushing back, as all those countless gallons, uh, uncountable gallons came flowing back into the lake, all those lives then that were going to be redeemed by the sacrifice of this one man. The man must give himself of his own will, and the lake must take his life, its life, from, that, from he who died. Otherwise, the offering would be of no avail. And if humanity could not find that hero. If there was no hero for humanity, then it was time they all should perish. There's a great scene in Milton's Paradise Lost, which is about this. Uh, the uh, rebel angels, Satan and the rebel angels have revolted. Um, Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. Satan has succeeded uh, in corrupting Adam and Eve or participating in their corruption. Uh, corrupting their free will so that they choose badly. And now, justly, because that was what the promise was, justly they have chosen death. But the Father in heaven gathers around all his remaining loyal angels and asks them, how can we find a way to get beyond death? I can't, God said, I will not. I cannot remove the curse of death. That is the curse of the abuse of their freedom. But can we find a way? Can we find somebody is somebody willing to sacrifice themselves for mankind? He asks all the angels, from Michael and, and Raphael and Gab Gabriel at the very top, all the way down to Abdiel, the smallest of all the angels. And all throughout heaven, there is nothing but silence. No man, no angel can be found willing to sacrifice himself for these new creatures, man and woman, until the silence breaks and it is the Son of God, the Son of God, not yet Christ, because he wouldn't be, he's not, be thousands of years before he'd be born into human form, but the Son of God comes forth and offers himself for mankind, right? The angels themselves wouldn't do it, but the Son does. And it took a mediating act like that to be able to break down uh, the wall 
that separates us from God. A wall we built, he didn't, and allow us now, through dying, to come back to him. And if you look again at the language, whoever this man was, he must give himself of his own will. And the lake must take his life as it filled. Otherwise, that offering would be of no avail. If the nation could not, if the human race in this case could not find one hero willing to sacrifice for it, then maybe it was time that we all should perish. And the only one capable of that sacrifice was Christ. In the fairy tale, it's different, of course. It's mediated, and that becomes the prince. And so here is the prince reasoning to himself. He knows what the, what the, the, the plate, that the gold plate says. So here's the prince's thought process. Now, should he help the princess? Quote, he says to himself, she will die if I don't do it. And my life would be nothing without her. So I shall lose nothing by doing it. And life will be as pleasant to her as ever, for she will soon forget me. And there will, be no, there will be so much more beauty and happiness in the world if she's alive. To be sure, I shall not live to see it. Here the poor prince gave a sigh. How lovely the lake will be in the moonlight, with that glorious creature sporting in it like a wild goddess. And so you think about that passage there, it's quite moving. He being very, very rational, right? Well, whether if I don't do, no other man could be found throughout the king's kingdom. No other man, including the king himself, I would add, was willing to voluntarily drown to save the daughter, to save the princess. And so he reasons to himself that she'll die if I don't do it. And, lo- and what would my life be without? That's the suffering of love. That's how love is death in the poem, right? Without her, my life becomes a dead thing. Without her love, my life dies. That's how love is death. She will die if I don't do it, and life would be nothing to me without her. So I shall lose nothing by doing it. Meanwhile, for those who remain alive, life will be as pleasant to her as ever. She will be happy. Her happiness even though she'll forget me. And this is the tragedy, right? She will forget me because she doesn't know how to love and she doesn't know how to sympathize. And most importantly, she cannot empathize. And so she will surely, in the same way you make the argument, how have we forgotten? How have we in the world, how have we who call ourselves Christians uh, routinely on a daily basis, how have we forgotten the sacrifice made by Christ for all of us? in our moments of depression and anxiety and anger and foolishness and selfish comfort, we forget daily, right? We forget daily. Uh, In this country now, we have one day dedicated on the year to give thanks, one day of thanksgiving. Uh, And that's become occupied by turkey and overeating and NFL football games, right? Uh, How much time do we spend thanking, giving thanks on Thanksgiving versus those other rather mundane pursuits? And so like the world that forgot God, remember in the opening of the Gospel of John that we, we just recently did a talk on, right? That he, he, the word, Christ is the word. The word entered the world. The world knew him not. He was light as in the light princess. He entered the world and the darkness did not know him, right? It's that same thing here with the prince's reasoning. She will die if I don't do it. And life would be nothing to me without her. So I shall lose nothing by doing it. And life will be as pleasant to her as ever. And she will soon forget me. And there will be so much more beauty and happiness in the world if she's allowed to live. To be sure, I won't see it. And here the poor prince gave a sigh. How lovely the lake will be in the moonlight with that glorious creature sporting in it like a wild goddess. It is rather hard to be drowned by inches, though. That's a tough way to die, the prince says, to uh, be at the bottom of the lake as the water slowly rose. It is rather hard to be drowned by inches, though. Let me see. That will be 70 inches of me to drown. Here he tried to laugh, but really could not. The longer the better, however, he resumed. For can I not bargain? Can I not at least ask the king for a few concessions if I am to sacrifice myself willingly for her? For can I not bargain that the princess, she will have to be beside me the whole time? So I shall see her once more. Kiss her, perhaps. Who knows? 
and die looking in her eyes. That would be no death. At least I shall not feel it. And to see the lake filling for the beauty again. To see the lake filling for her. All right, I am ready. That's really quite lovely, right? This calculation. Beautiful. And think about this too. Now, this is lessons for adults. Now, this fairy tale is adult stuff, but it's also a beautiful story for kids. You read kids, your kids this story, they're going to be absolutely enchanted, at, enchanted by it. And they may not be able, as, at six or seven years old, be able to, or five years old, they may not be able to grasp the theology, but they will intrinsically understand the nature of the sacrifice. That's how fairy tales teach little kids difficult lessons, even profoundly theological lessons that their little minds can't grasp yet, it instills it in their hearts. And so the beauty of the story is here, right? Uh, I cannot, his love for her. I'm going to die. And what? Inch by inch, I will be drowned. But, but if that's going to happen, why can't I bargain with the king? Why can't I make sure that she's there with me the whole time? Who knows? Maybe she'll kiss me. Maybe I'll die looking into her eyes. And that really wouldn't be death at all. I'm ready, he says. And here's the princess. Now, that the, now the, king, the kingdom rejoices. The king and his queen, they're thrilled. They found somebody. Even the princess recognizes this. When the princess heard that a man had offered to die for her, she was so transported that she jumped off the bed, feeble as she was, and danced about the room for joy. She did not care who the man was. That was nothing to her. And again, before you're too harsh on the princess, she had no gravity. She was cursed, like we're all cursed. We're cursed. That it's the stain of iniquity on us. It's, for lack of a better word, it's our original sin, isn't it? She's cursed. She did not care who the man was. That was nothing to her. The hole needed stopping. And if only a man would do, why then take one? In an hour or two, everything was ready. Her maid dressed her in haste, and they carried her to the side of the lake. When she saw it, she shrieked because it was so uh, dying and covered her face with her hands. They bore her across the mud to the stone where they had already placed a little boat for her. So there at the center of the lake where they found that, that gold medallion, there's where the hole was. The prince was going to have to insert himself, his feet into that hole, right? And while the water came back and she in a little boat, because as the water came rushing back in, the boat would rise, right? She in a little boat got to stay by her, by the, was ordered to stay by the prince's side. That was the condition of the prince doing this. They bore her across to the stone where they had already placed a little boat for her. And as the lake begins to fill, slowly, slowly, inch by inch, the water comes running back in, right, starting at the lowest point and rising. Now, the prince creates a song for her. He sings to her a song, and the song is absolutely gorgeous. I'll give you a little taste of it. There. So you see the image, right? The water's beginning to rise. She's there by his side because she has to be. Oh, the other thing the prince demanded, that not only, because this was going to take a long time, inch by inch the water was going to come back. And this is a huge lake. It used to be a huge lake. So it was going to take a while for him to die. It's going to take days and days. And so what the prince requires is not only that the princess be by his side the entire time, but that when necessary, she would feed him a little bit of wine, a little bit of biscuit, all right? Some biscuit and some wine. And so as the water slowly begins to return, begins to rise, uh, she's talking to him, keeping him company. And when necessary, she'll feed him a little bit of bread, a little bit of wine. Uh, and then he sings to her. And the song is lovely. As a world that has no well, darting bright in forest dell, as a world without the gleam, the downward going stream, as a world without the glance of the ocean's fair expanse, as a world where never rain glittered on the sunny plain. So, my heart, thy world would be if no love did flow in thee. Ah, that's really remarkable. What would the human heart be like if the capacity for sacrificial love didn't exist? If all love was selfish love? And this is a really bad warning, a dire warning for the modern world. 
As we become more scientifically gifted, as we become more materially comforted, as we have more, more, more stuff, we have become a, a technology, a, 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 a culture in love with technology, not in love with people. We have become a culture driven by tech, not driven by love. What would the world be like if the idea that love requires sacrifice even to death the modern, the moderns, the postmodern atheist does not believe that anymore. In our postmodern culture, suffering for love is not an option. Suffering is the enemy. Suffering must be eradicated. And that means not letting babies be born if they're not going to have the quality of life we think they should have. Euthanizing people now simply because they're just depressed and don't want to live anymore. There's no sacrificial love there. The easiest thing in the world to do to people who suffer is put them to death. It's the easiest thing in the world to do, and we call it mercy. Go back to the poem for a second. What would the world be like if the possibility of suffering for love didn't exist? What would mankind's fate be if there was no option for the Son of God to suffer in love for us? It would be like a world that has no water, as a world that has no well darting bright in forest dell. It would be like a world without the gleam of the downward go, a world, with, again, without any water. It would be like a world without the glance of the ocean's fair expanse. It would be as a world where never rain glitter, glittered on the sunny plain. Such my heart, the prince says, such my heart, my heart would be. If no love ever did flow in thee, he says to her, and she can't love. His death is required, perhaps, to make her at least love the lake, which would come back. And if you go to the end of the poem, lady, he says to her, keep thy world's delight. If the only thing in this world you love, you don't love. Remember, we saw that passage last time. She loved the lake much more than her mother and father. She loved the lake much more than the prince. It's all she knew because it was the only thing that gave her some modicum of weight. And so he says to her, lady, keep thy world's delight. Keep the waters in thy sight. Love hath made me strong to go. Beautiful, right? My love for you has given me strength to die for you. That's love is death, right? Lady, keep thy world's delight. Keep thy waters in thy sight. Love hath made me strong to leave, to go, for thy sake, to realms below, where the waters shine and hum through the darkness, though the darkness never come. Let, I pray, one thought of me spring a little well in thee. Now that's beautiful, right? I'm going to go away beneath the waves. Like we said, the waves are going to roll over me, right? I will be forgotten. You will forget me. But let I pray, I say this prayer, just one little thought of me. Let that become a tiny spring, a little well in you, in thee, so that you'll remember, lest thy loveless soul be found like a dry and thirsty ground. Here's hoping that my death for you, that my sacrifice for you, will cause you to remember me even just a little bit, that there is some little spring of hope in that dry soul of yours. And that is the Christ story, isn't it? That's the story. Uh, you know, you think about all these thousands of years since the death and resurrection of the Savior, and how, again, even those of us who know the story and who call ourselves his, uh, how, how much, how little time, how little is the spring of love for him in us? How little is that reservoir of water, of tears for him uh, in the course of our daily life and all of our pleasures and our uh, worldliness? Uh, go back to the clip. Lady, keep thy world's delight. Keep the waters in thy sight. Love hath made me strong to go for thy sake to realms below where the waters shine and hum, through the darkness never come. Let, I pray, one thought of me spring a little well in thee, lest thy loveless soul be found like a dry and thirsty ground. What would, what, the, the, the landscape of our human emotions would be an arid desert without that love of Christ, and there would be no compensation for it. 
Uh, all such love would go away. And again, I warn you, as we as a material culture move farther away from sacrificial love, notice how arid and sterile human love becomes. There is nothing more arid, dry, sterile, and ultimately barren than liberal progressive love, the love of the materialist atheist progressive. You love as groups, you love from afar. Love means killing, love means aborting, love means euthanizing. Love means that somebody else suffers for love, not you. And so what happens in the story? I love Maurice Sendak's illustration of this moment. Take a look at it. So there you have the princess. There's the prince. The water's already up to his ears. And she's feeding him bread and wine. In other words, she's feeding him the body and blood of Christ without even knowing she's doing it. Sendak recognized that the biscuit and the wine that sustained the prince while he was suffering was indeed God. And so there's the princess not knowing what she's doing, feeding him wafer and wine. Uh, and it's a beautiful, beautiful image as he suffers for her. And if we move forward. So the water grew and grew and rose up and up on the prince. And the princess sat and looked at him. She fed him now and then. The night wore on, the waters rose and rose, the moon rose likewise higher and higher and shone full on the face of the dying prince. The water was up to his neck. Will you kiss me, princess? said he feebly. All of his nonchalance was gone now. Yes, I will, answered the princess and kissed him with a long, sweet, cold kiss. That's interesting, right? The only way she can kiss is coldly. There can be no feeling, no suffering behind it. Will you kiss me, princess, said he feebly. The nonchalance was all gone now. Yes, I will, answered the princess, and kissed him with a long, sweet, cold kiss. Now, said he with a sigh of content, I die happy. Consumatum est, right? It is finished, Christ said for the, from the cross. That moment that he uh, suffered all that he could suffer, shed every drop of blood uh, that he could shed. And interestingly for the light princess, it's not just every drop of blood that Christ shed, the Gospels tell us, but every last drop of water too. You remember when the centurion took his spear and pierced the side of Christ on the cross? The last few drops of blood and then bloody water uh, seeped from the side of the Savior, and he was done. Consumatum est. He had finished his sacrificial love. Will you kiss me, princess, said he feebly. The nonchalance was all gone now. Yes, I will, Ella answered the princess, and kissed him with that long, sweet, cold kiss. Now, said he, with a sigh of content, I die happy. He did not speak again. The princess gave him some wine for the last time, but he was past eating. Then she sat down again and looked at him. The water rose and rose. It touched his chin. It touched his lower lip. It touched between his lips. He shut them hard to keep it out. And the princess? She began to feel strange. It touched his upper lip. He breathed through his nostrils. The princess looked wild. It covered his nostrils. Her eyes looked scared and shone strange in the moonlight. His head fell back. The water closed over it, and the bubbles of his last breath bubbled up through the water. The princess gave a shriek and sprang into the lake. This is the moment, right? This is the moment that it dawns on her. She sees what happens to him, and now she gets it. The only thing that could make her react this way is the birth of real love in her heart, love that is sacrifice. On a in a much less serious uh, fairy tale, think about how the Grinch stole Christmas. Uh, up on Mount Crumpet, the, the evil Grinch comes and steals all the Christmas presents, right? And he thinks that because the Who's are so materialistic, right? Little Who's down in Whoville, all they want is presents and toys. He thinks that by stealing their Christmas, he has broken them. He's going to cause them to suffer. And when that Christmas morning, when they all get up, instead of lamenting sighs and sobs for their lost stuff, all the Who's down in Whoville join hands together and begin to sing a carol to God, to Christmas. 
Well, what happens at this moment when the Grinch hears that song, that song of sacrificial love? His heart grows three sizes, right? He becomes a different man. He understands differently how things work. And in a much more serious way, that's what happens here, right? As she watches the water close over the face of her prince, for the first time in her life, she not just sympathizes, but she empathizes. That love becomes suffering for her. The princess gave a shriek and sprang into the lake. She laid hold first of one of the prince's legs and then of the other, and she pulled and she tugged, but she could not move either. She stopped to take a breath, and that made her think that he could not get any breath. That's lovely, right? The fact that she can't breathe as she tries to lo loosen his legs reminds her for the first time of the suffering of somebody else, of the suffering of somebody that she loves. She stopped to take a breath, and that made her think that he couldn't breathe. She was frantic. She got hold of him and held his head above the water, which was possible now his hands were no longer on the hole. But it was of no use, for he was past breathing. Love and water, love and water, tears, love and suffering, brought back all her strength. She got under the water and pulled and pulled with her whole might, till at last she got one leg out, the other easily followed. How she got him into the boat, she never could tell. But when she did, she fainted away. The princess burst into a passion of tears. When did this happen? Well, it's a fairy tale. She got him into the boat. She passed out. At that point, running across the mud come the king's servants, and they drag her and the, her and the boat and the prince back to the kingdom. And for hours and hours and hours, the king's doctors work on the prince until at daybreak, they're able to get him to breathe again. He comes back to life, right? He comes back to life at that dawn. He breathes again. And when the princess, who's been worried out of her mind, and who hasn't flown away, by the way, for the first time, who seems anchored by her grief, when the princess finds out that the prince is alive, well, then... The princess burst into a passion of tears and fell on the floor. There she lay for an hour, and her tears never ceased. All the pent-up crying of her life was spent now, and a rain came on from her eyes such as never been seen in that country. The sun shone all the time, and the great drops which fell straight to the earth shone like li likewise. Her crying spurred the crying of the heavens. Why did it go dark, and the earth quake, and the, th the skies opened and stormed the moment Christ died. Why did it happen? Because all of nature cried too, right? Her tears, a, a lifetime's worth of tears, come gushing from her. The palace was in the heart of a rainbow. It was a rain of rubies and sapphires and emeralds and topazes. The torrents poured down from the mountains like molten gold, and if it had not been for its subterraneous outlet, the lake would have overflowed and inundated the country. We we get, how do we get away from another Noah's Ark? How do we avoid the lake that was recently emptied so, from, oh, because triggered by these tears of the princess, overflowing and drowning them all as happened with Noah's Ark? How do we do that? Sacrificial love. What had happened to the people of Noah's time? They had lost sympathy. They had lost empathy. They could no longer even contemplate the God who made them. They were dead things. How do we avoid that here? The palace was in the heart of a rainbow. It was a rain of rubies, sapphires, emeralds, topazes. The torrents poured down from the mountains like molten gold. And if it had not been for the sub subterraneous outlet beneath the lake, the lake would have overflowed and inundated the entire country. It was full from shore to shore. But the princess, who loved the lake up to this point, loved the lake more than anything, but the princess did not even notice the lake. She lay on the floor and wept. And this rain within doors was far more wonderful than the rain out of doors, because that's, those tears gave her back her heart and soul. So what happens? It's a fairy tale. Of course, the prince and princess were betrothed at once. 
but the princess had to learn to walk before they could be married. And that's a beautiful lesson, too, for little kids. Finding the truth is easy. But to grow up in the truth, to learn how to love sacrificially, to learn how to love not like a child, as St. Paul says, with childish things, but to love like an adult and a servant of God, that takes time. Of course, the prince and princess were betrothed at once, but the princess had to learn to walk before they could be married with any propriety. And this was not so easy as her, at her time of life, for she could walk no more than a baby. The older we get, the more deep we should become in love. And if we don't, then we're worse than children. She was always falling down and hurting herself. And that's good, right? The mother who will not let her child fall because she loves the child too much is not a mother that loves her child. It's a mother who hinders her child. If every time a baby, a toddler, stood up and tried to walk, if mom immediately grabbed it and put it back down on all fours so there's no way it could fall, that's not an act of love. That's an act of imprisonment, isn't it? And so think about the kind of paternalistic love that we get from the radical left, the atheist left. It's a love, love that says, we love you so much, we won't let you do anything. You won't take care of your own lives. You won't be responsible for your own children. You won't be responsible for your own health care. Big brother will do it for you. Big daddy will look after you. From cradle to grave, you won't have to do anything. We'll tell you if you're allowed to be born. We'll decide when you die. This is what always happens when we replace the sacrificial love of Christ with the selfish love that turns into state love, right? This is statism. This is the selfish culture we have created the more we wander away from God. This is the first commandment violated. I am the Lord your God. You shall not have false gods before me. And the idea that man alone is enough for man, that reason alone is enough for man, that science alone is enough for man, it is a dangerous lie. And it gives rise to the kind of love that destroys everything. False love predicated love, love that is uh, mediated by selfishness and self-interest, that is ultimately abortive and euthanizing and sterile. And so what happens here? She was always falling down and hurting herself. And you know what? Falling down and skinning her knees was the best damn thing that ever happened to her. And the tears that came with it and the experience that she got from it, that's what made her human again. She turns to the prince and she says, is this the gravity you used to make so much of? said she one day to the prince as he raised her from the floor. For my part, I was a great deal more comfortable without it. And isn't that the problem? Love without suffering gives rise to comfort. We shouldn't let babies be born if they're not going to be comfortable. If you're old and unhappy and uncomfortable, we should kill you too. Anybody who's not comfortable shouldn't have to live. That's not love. She said, I was far more comfortable, she says, when I didn't have the gravity. His response is, no, 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 that's not it, princess. This is it, replied the prince, as he took her up and carried her about like a baby, kissing her all the time. This is gravity, our love, and the fact that we're willing to suffer so much for each other. This, princess, is real gravity. Oh, that's better, said she. I don't mind it so much. And she smiled the sweetest, loveliest smile in the prince's face, and she gave him one little kiss in return for all of his. And he thought them overpaid, for he was beside himself with delight. And so the prince and princess lived and were happy and had crowns of gold and cloths of cloth and shoes of leather and children of boys and girls, not one of whom was ever known on the most critical occasion to lose the smallest atom of his or her due proportion of gravity. Their kids grew up knowing and loving the right way. And as we close, we see George MacDonald reading fairy tales to his kids. Interesting father he would have been to teach those kids so well, reading to his own kids his own fairy tales. And we close with a simple comment from C.S. Lewis. Remember, we began by pointing out all those weeks ago that C.S. Lewis, one of the most complicated, deep thinkers of the 20th century, one of the greatest Christian apologists in human history, he called George MacDonald his master, not his teacher, his master. That everything I ever learned about life, about love, I learned from MacDonald. Here's what Lewis said about fairy tales and why fairy tales are perhaps uh, the single most important stories we have both for children 
and for adults who need to learn to love like kids again. Lewis said in 1956, why did I write fairy tales? Because according to him, the title of the article he wrote was, say, fairy tales say best, maybe sometimes Lewis said, fairy tales say best what needs to be said. Lewis says, I wrote fairy tales because the fairy tale seemed the ideal form for the stuff I had to say. I thought I, I thought I saw how stories of this kind could steal past a certain inhibition that had paralyzed much of my own childhood, my own religion and childhood. Something inhibited me, Lewis said. When I was a little boy and I went to Sunday school and my mom took me to church, there was something about the nature of organized religion that distanced me from God. It didn't bring me closer. And maybe I thought, Lewis, that said that maybe it was fairy tales that got past this in inhibition. Remember what G.K. Chesterton said, right? That everything I learned about God and about the world, I didn't learn in church. I learned it from my nurse through fairy tales. Lewis says, I wrote fairy tales because the fairy tales seemed to me the best way to say what I had to say. I thought I saw how stories of, of the fairy tale type could get me past a certain inhibition that had paralyzed much of my own religion in childhood. Why? Why did one find it so hard to feel as one was told one ought to feel about God or about the suffering of Christ? When I went to Sunday school and they showed me the pictures of Christ's suffering or we read the gospel passages or the priest, the pastor lectured, the sermonized about how Jesus suffered, why was I unable to feel it? Why was there something between me and the suffering? Why did one find it so hard to feel as one was told one ought to feel? about God or about the sufferings of Christ. I thought the chief reason was that one was told one ought to feel that way. We, we were to love Christ because we should. We should understand his suffering because we ought to. An obligation to feel can very often freeze feelings, not make them grow. And reverence itself did harm. The whole subject of religion as to a child was associated with lowered, lowered voices hushed tones, almost as if it were something medical, the way we talk about God in church. Maybe, Lewis said, that fairy tales taught me to feel the love of God and to feel the suffering of Christ in ways that church couldn't because of its solemnity, because of its formalness. And maybe that's why fairy tales are as much or more church as church itself. At least they have been for people down through the centuries. Thank you for being with us today and look forward, uh, please look forward and keep your eyes open for our next series of lectures uh, coming down the road soon. Thank you. <laughs>